Hi guys, welcome to another live session of uh, Late Show with Inbaraj. We have a very interesting topic today and it's on social enterprise, right? So social enterprise has been a very exciting scene in the last few years. Uh, as a part of our startup ecosystem, uh, there are a lot of programs that have been, you know, happening for the social enterprise section. And there's so many amazing entrepreneurs have come out to run all kinds of social enterprises. So today we have uh, two very amazing entrepreneurs. Uh, first, we have uh, Amelia Tan. Amelia Tan runs uh, the 100% project. They are in the education scene. And we have Suzanne. Suzanne runs uh, Picha Eats. Used to be known as the Picha Project. Now they've rebranded to Picha Eats. And they are in the FNB industry. So we have two uh, social enterprise entrepreneurs from two different industries. And we just want to learn more about what they are doing and how they are dealing with this MCO and COVID-19 situation. So without further ado, I'll add them both in first let's welcome emilia hi hi emilia hello how are you Imba? and we have suzanne hi suzanne your audio your I mute. myself hey emilia hi, hi. nice all right so you. welcome guys to our little talk show here mm -hmm. uh something that i recently started to keep myself busy a bit <laughs> so I just want to, as part of our Open Coffee Club and other startup communities, I wanted to, uh, you know, showcase all our entrepreneur friends and see how everyone is doing during this <laughs> COVID situation. So I yeah. thought of uh, also doing a special topic on social enterprise because a lot of people have been also asking me, uh, you know, how's the social enterprise scene? And mm. because it seems like everybody is busy now because this situation seems to be, you know, getting you guys very busy when other people are like at home doing nothing. So I thought <laughs> maybe I should chat with you guys to find out more, you know. Uh, so yeah, Emilia, maybe you can start with an introduction about yourself for those who maybe don't yeah. know you are. Yeah, could okay, maybe talk so about you and your projects. Okay, so I run 100% Project. Um, that's been around for four years now, but um, I've actually kind of taken a step back from that. So we just recently hired a CEO to run the show. Uh, so n this is a time where she's like really busy uh, getting things done. But on the side, I'm also running, um, starting up this new social enterprise called Mangosteen. It's funded by a philanthropist. And what we basically do is create uh, brands, personal care products, right, where 100% of the profits actually goes to charity. So it's been a very interesting time. i uh, been developing a product for the past one year, about to launch, and then this COVID-19 hit, and we have to re basically redevelop a brand new product during this time. Yeah. So, but in a nutshell, that's kind of like what I do. All right, interesting. Uh, and Suzanne? All right, so um, I'm Suzanne and I'm from Picha Eats. We have also been around for about four years. So what we do is we run a food business where we partner with um, mothers from the refugee community to run this food business. So we do buffet catering, we do food delivery, and all our chefs are the moms from Syria, Palestine, Iraq, and so on. So yeah, so that's what we've been doing. And, and yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay, so first question. How much has this uh, lockdown or MCO uh, affected your business? And how have you been dealing with this? So it's a very general question, but feel free to share whatever you would like to share. All right. Uh, I want to um, go first. <laughs> I, can, I can go first. Um, I, think, I think we... Um, how do I say? Because we are a food business, so we are considered essential. So we, we, I wouldn't say we are affected by MCO, but we are affected by like the situation and COVID virus uh, as a whole. Because um, we actually started getting affected since January. Uh, as I mentioned, we run this food business where we do buffet catering and food delivery. And buffet catering plus the B2B sector actually takes up about 60% of our total sales. And since January, it has dropped like crazy and I think you can imagine mid-February onwards it's almost completely zero because no one could gather anymore all the Chinese New Year gatherings are cancelled all the um all the celebrations are basically cancelled and that's what we catered to the most uh, all conferences are cancelled events are cancelled so we were um, starting to get affected ever since uh, January um, but I think when MCO happened what we told ourselves is um 
um, I think what we really learned throughout this period is that we can't get too attached to, that's what we always learn in magic, don't get too attached to your product and your business idea. If, if, if there is a need to pivot, you have to change, like no matter what. So um, this year, in the beginning of the year, we did our strategic planning and everything, and the goal is on catering. Like this year, our goal is to ramp up our catering, double our buffet catering, train out our crew. We have like all the, um, all the like, what what is that called? Uh, upskilling workshop line up for our catering crew because that was our main focus. And then now, bam, catering will be gone for the rest of this year. So um, what we what we uh, really started doing was the, the day MCO was announced, um, me and my co-founders came and Sweden, we jumped on a call immediately. And the next day, we just push out all the comms that we can to say that we are operating throughout MCO. And the first day of MCO, we all look internally to the team to figure out uh, what strength do we have and how can we have a, a, a different revenue stream because right now 60% of our business will be gone already for maybe the next half year mm -hmm. or, or even the, the, the rest of the year. We are not sure. Everything's so uncertain. So every mm -hmm. I think I'm, I'm really thankful. We are all very thankful that the team were all uh, in this together. Uh, everyone was very open to change. Everyone was very fast and quick to adapt and change. And right now, we are actually incubating two MCO babies. So we actually have um, uh, different wings of the business coming out so that we get more revenue stream. And I think that has really pushed us to just like, go out and like think big and think of ourselves beyond just a food business. Um, another thing that really helped was um, re we reactivated the Zaza movement. So the Zaza movement is a movement that we started two years ago in memory of one of our chefs who passed away. His name is Zaza. And he is the kind of person who always like to give out food to others when he cooked. So we actually started the Zaza movement after he passed away due to cancer to give out food to people who want it. Um, and when MCO happened, I think uh, everyone know that a lot of people needed food, the frontliners, the community. So we reactivated that and we started giving food and people saw us doing that and they started to chip in. So they buy food from our chef and we give the food out to the communities and that gave us another um, source of support for all our chefs and for us as well to get through this period. So that has been how the four or five weeks has been. It has been crazy. Like, like the first two weeks, we were just like, <laughs> and now things are a bit more settled down. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Very good to hear that. Uh, how about you, uh, Emilia, on your side? Yeah. It's also been quite crazy because like um, right now I'm managing two different things, right? So with 100% Project, like uh, after hiring the CEO, we actually had a plan to kind of do a huge fundraiser for teachers around the country. So that was going to be somewhere in May or June, right? Um, so the, the platform was actually kind of like closed for the time being to prepare for that. But once like COVID-19 hit, we were thinking like, okay, we have a crowdfunding platform. What can we do? And we decided to just kind of like let's just open it up, right? Because we have the infrastructure already. People are going to be able to uh, need to raise funds. So let's just do it. So initially, I think the first need was like PPE equipment. So we were like, okay, okay let's, let's raise funds for PPE. And that's what we did. But then halfway through, and I think like this is quite consistent within um, the social enterprise NGO space because there's a lot of cross collaboration. A lot of people are right now like trying to do what they can, collaborate together to kind of like basically provide PPE, uh, make sure that the most vulnerable communities have food, have groceries. Even yourself, Inba, you're doing that as well, right? So we see a lot of cross collaborations going on. Um, but so basically, we started with PPE, but then we realized that okay, a lot of people are doing PPE, so we don't want to like you know overcrowd the space and let the people who know what to do do that. Uh, although we do currently still have a fundraiser running, uh, we the coalition right now is called Ruma Kita. It's quite amazing. It's actually a bunch of people, just random people that came together uh, to start like just doing stuff and basically creating a hotline for hospitals to call in to basically let people know what kind of shortages they have in terms of PPE. And then, you know, this bunch of people they just kind of gathered. Um, the movement basically um, consists of people from the Jaga, uh, Kita Jaga Kita movement, um, TEDx, um, you know, Basically, they collaborate with BGBG, of a bunch of them, right? So we are basically one of the uh, crowdfunding platforms to help them raise funds uh, for these efforts. So we are helping with these grassroots community efforts, but at the same time, we're also op uh, told teachers as well that they can raise funds for, for whatever initiatives. And some of the things that we saw is like as simple as this teacher in Tenom. Um, she basically needed to fund fundraise 500 ringgit because she teaches math. And uh, her students, basically, she's trying to teach her students math online. 
but they don't have enough data to send her homework. Okay. So basically, she raised 500 ringgit so that she can basically buy 10 ringgit data to give it to them so that they can submit homework, you know. So teachers are basically quite interesting to see what teachers are currently doing during this time. Because teaching online, especially with the big 40 communities, when a lot of them actually don't have phones or don't have internet access, has been quite hard. So what we're trying to do is right now trying to get teachers to um, really do what they can to raise funds, you know, for uh, for for their students, uh, and also basically becoming leaders in the community. So we see a lot of teachers stepping up in that front as well. Um, yeah, and so we also are collaborating with like an a uh, corporate coalition as well. They are also raising funds for PPE. So we in one hundred percent project. That's what we're kind of doing, uh, but we are also looking at pivoting uh, to try to start introducing content online. So we're currently working on that as well. Yeah. So that's the education front. But for Mangosteen, before this, I was creating a line of personal care products, basically body body wash, body sh shampoo, where 100% of the products will be donated to charity. But at this point, what we're currently doing is we're collaborating with Asli & Co. Asli & Co is a social enterprise that works with single around Asli mothers. So they currently are producing a hand sanitizer. And so we're collaborating with them to actually produce and develop a hand sanitizer as well. So we just added a new product range that's currently what I've been working on. Hopefully we'll be able to launch something by uh, May, you know, uh, which is very soon. So yeah, been really, really busy with just coordinating all the different things. Actually, yeah. I find that so very I feel you then, I feel you. It's very interesting. The 100% of the profit goes to a, a social cause, right? Uh, how how, yeah. actually, how did they wait? Just out of curiosity, because today I, I bought something, okay. I bought a product so, so, that, yeah, that said 100% yeah. of the profit goes to a social cost, right? It's actually a yeah. bottle of salsa. So I picked that mm -hmm. in favor of another brand because this one said 100% of the profit goes to a, a charity. But you yeah. know, I, I didn't actually read through the labels because you know now during MCO, right, grocery shopping is scary. Mm -hmm. So we don't yeah. find, spend a lot of time at the, <laughs> at the aisles. So I quickly picked the yeah. product, told my wife, no, let's buy this, that I came home. Uh, so, but yeah. how does it work actually? What's the model? Is there a fixed model to how that works or or does the social enterprise get to choose like how much you take on your salaries and how much you consider as a profit? Like how, how do you guys okay. work on that? Well, on my friend, um, the thing is Mangosteen is actually, uh, it's not mine. It's actually uh, funded by a philanthropist, which is why the 100% profit thing can work. Because if it's just me, then there's no way I can, I'll be able to sustain that, right? Yeah. So um the main the thing is right now we're not going to be actually putting ourselves in supermarkets or whatever it's going to be all online there's no point in having a physical store uh we might uh, put ourselves on certain e-commerce platforms do cost collaborations with certain brands uh but the main mission right now because magazine was actually created to basically um channel uh revenue to non-profits and causes where they can't actually have a social enterprise model because not every cause can generate revenue, you know. For example, like feeding feeding people who are vulnerable. You need donations, you know. You can't, you know, have like a sustainable business model. You rely on donations. So what Mangosteen is created for is really to basically channel funds to these organizations that do not have a product. Like with Picture, I think you guys are great because you actually have a product that people want, mm -hmm. right? But at the end of the day, as generous as people are, when it comes to a product, they want to know whether your product tastes good, looks yeah. good, is functional or not. Yeah. Whether it's as a social cause, only a small percentage of people will care whether this goes to a social cause. So a lot of like uh, causes out there don't actually have a product, right? Mm -hmm. They can't actually sell anything. And so what Magazine was actually created to basically aid these organizations that do not have these products with our product, essentially. Right. So that means if they, do they help to market or sell your products in, so, and they get the portion of the profit? Yes, we will be collaborate with them. So basically, every product we have, we will actually like let people know where does this go to. But basically, the right. causes that we're going to be support supporting would be causes uh, organizations that support women and children. Okay. Right. Interesting. Okay. So we have a question here. I'll just pop up the question here. Would social enterprises uh, generally consider implementing IR 4.0 to enhance the business? I think uh, maybe he's referring more to hardware stuff like using drones or robotic technologies or something like that. Have you guys considered anything anything cool like Can that? You use drones to deliver your food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I think definitely, yes. Um I think that there is this um 
there's there's this observation that we make that some people might might look at social enterprises as um probably still sort of like in between a business as a charity but i think um i think the the truth is social enterprise operates as a business but we are driven by an impact and there is a different consideration in our head before we make certain decisions because we work with community so would social enterprise consider implementing ir uh, i mean ir 4.0 to enhance its business i think definitely because we are still um an organization and a business that should strive for uh, growth and to go to like the tech side and to constantly improve. Um, not, and it's not because uh, we are a social enterprise and we should just stay at certain place. So I think definitely yes. Uh, whatever whatever that's available in the market that businesses are on need to grow themselves, that's where we should strive to go as well. So I think that's that's what we think. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, right. de definitely, I think during this time that you can see definitely there's a push, right? Everyone mm -hmm. is digitizing, you know, everyone's going on e-commerce, right? Everyone's trying to digital marketing, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's inevitable, you know, we all will have to shift in that direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we are also like trying to figure out because um in, in Picha we have very high human touch point where we always like go to the chef's house, we have spot checks, um, we go and spend time with them, we talk to them. It's a very high human touch business. And even if we service certain clients, we meet face to face. I think this has definitely pushed us to think if we can turn all this into um tech or uh, turn it in a way where we don't have to be physically there so recently uh, our team has started doing a hygiene check via video call and it, it actually <laughs> kind of works so it sort of pushed us to think okay next time when mco is lifted maybe we should also consider this and how can we next time use tech or virtual reality to actually check mm -hmm. um their kitchen process instead of going there physically because that will incur like very high labor labor it's very labor intensive la, to like send someone there to check so so yeah it's been it's been stretching everyone a lot i think also the situation has forced everyone to somehow get hold of a phone or you know internet <laughs> so that they can communicate so in a way it's made it easier i think like three months ago if you video call someone then you know they'll tell you they got no mic they got no <laughs> they got no webcam all kind of excuses will come up yeah. right? but now people don't have that because everyone is you know even those who are underserved somehow they are getting hold of some kind of devices mm -hmm. in order to be you know order food or get help so i guess in a way everybody is more connected now so maybe that's one good thing that's coming out of this and now we have another questions from the comments uh, 100 percent profits go to charity wonder how you guys sustain from operating costs yeah so basically when you say profit yeah. right so we're looking at profit right so basically you will have to minus all the costs mm. of like you know overheads and whatever right and then whatever profits goes to charity so meaning uh the shareholders don't take dividends and the whatever profits you make after you cover the cost basically goes to charity. But it's everyone does that. work. But everyone gets paid a salary and all that, right? So you can uh, yes, operate sustainably. Yes. yes. Yeah. There's no way you all... can just add you know, all your revenue. I think I think a lot of people get confused, right? The moment you say social enterprise, I think they assume you don't take a salary and you don't take a, you don't make money out of the yeah. business but because they think it's a charity somehow. So I think that's the mm -hmm. that's the part that a lot of people don't don't really understand how social enterprises operate. Uh, so yeah. we we have this little funny thing that happened to us. Uh, one of our colleagues were um taking um grab and she was sharing with the grab driver about what she does so the grab driver was going on and on and saying oh if this is what you do you shouldn't draw a salary and in her head she's mm -hmm. thinking so are you gonna pay for my grab fees today if i don't <laughs> a salary? yeah just yeah it's because we do this full time we also need to survive in a way yeah yeah okay but this is a very common perception right like even within the ngo space people always like uh talk about overheads right like oh you know you oversit so so high don't donate to this organization but the point is like if you don't pay for overheads who's gonna do the work you know who's exactly. gonna go on the, stage, the feed who's gonna like manage even like you have you still need you know like if you're a company or ngo you still need to do your accounts and all that stuff right yeah. so i think like this is a time where I think like most people will have that mindset shift where they realize that actually what is essential services, right? Essential services are basically a lot of these NGOs as well. That's why we're also busy, right? Because like we're out there, we're trying to solve this problem. Like suddenly it's like just so many things, so many requests yeah. and asks. I mean, I, I've explained this to a lot of people. I always tell them if you're running a social enterprise or even a charity organization, it doesn't mean zero profit, doesn't mean zero revenue. You still need to somehow generate money to run the businesses or even the charity program. It's just that you don't yeah. take a profit out of it. 
you know that's the part mm. that very hard for people to understand anyway uh, this is something i wanted to ask you uh, you guys in a way are an essential business but how much is the government cooperating with you guys like are they still putting a lot of blocks uh, making it hard for you or are they more you know flexible when it comes to social enterprises no no mm, <laughs> how I, about for you uh, for well, picha is it easy for you guys to deliver food or are you still having issues when it comes to delivery i think so far we are treated as a as a normal business so for food delivery if we have the proper documentation the proper papers we are fine um yeah and we can operate i think so far because we are registered as a sandram bahat uh, and in malaysia there is no um there is no like registration for social enterprise per se so i think we so far we are treated as a business because yeah. I, so, i heard some stories about how certain businesses like fnb businesses even restaurants yeah. were not allowed to deliver uh, at certain roadblocks they get turned away and all that uh, have you guys experienced anything like that mm, we we do have checks like the police ask but every time we show the letter so far things yeah. thankfully has been okay for us yeah. but i do know they came out with a new yeah. regulation yesterday that if you deliver by bike you have to have certain bar code something like that but we deliver okay. mainly by by car because our okay. we we go by sets so we don't deliver single boxes we do like family meals yeah right. so okay. basically usually it's cars okay that's good uh and amelia there's something that i wanted to ask you actually uh, someone approached me i think last week and asked about how we can do e learning for like uh, a school that has a lot of asli students because they don't have their own like phones and all that uh, yeah. so i suggested that maybe they should get some phone sponsored and somehow this yeah, person yeah. connected with uh, one of these corporate and managed to get some phone sponsor so is there any kind of initiatives or like uh, that sorts on your platform right now okay so on the education platform, side yeah. there are teachers who are raising like the teacher who raised funds for for yes, so we have that there are also other um foundations like YTL foundations right right now they are actually offering free phones and data plan for one year to basically any students in the B40 community So and these are for but these are only for Malaysian students. So um yeah, you feel free to go to the YTL Foundation website. They actually are offering free phones and a data plan. So, so uh, do yeah. the students have to apply or the teachers apply or the schools apply? How does this work? So um basically right now like um they've opened up they've initially asked teachers to nominate, you know, students that they know that are in the B40 community, but uh right now they basically open it up for anyone to nominate. So you will need to basically register on the website um and actually leave in um the ic number of the parents because mm. i think the parents will need to register for the students okay. yeah so that's one that's, that's available mm. all right we have a okay this is a good question it's a great way for you guys to educate people what uh, social <laughs> enterprises are all about uh, yeah. how do social enterprise get funding do you get yeah. funding from corporates government or loans um Okay so um for for us when we first started uh, we did get um a bit of I think the same same with Emilia as well we went through magic accelerator program so we got like a like a what what do you call that funding like a kickstart funding like a grant yeah. right like a grant a grant, right. grant for us to uh, start off and after that um actually um in Pitra we told ourselves that we must build like a strong business model to make sure that we are able to sustain ourselves so um very quickly we were manage well, we managed to be cash flow positive but again we were we weren't we we weren't running it we weren't building it in a way where we were burning money so we spend what we can and for example marketing we started with organic content marketing on social media until we have um we have enough money to run digital ads then we start with like 200 500 it slowly grew that way so we didn't go the route where we we suddenly invest a lot of money and then it grow exponentially which is why our growth for the past 3 years was um it was quite um we we didn't have like a, um I don't know how to say this but we 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 were growing organically lah for 3 years but um about last year we started uh, applying for grants because we know that we can continue to grow organically but if we do get a grant it can help us to push further where we can expand the team because the team eventually became the bottleneck because we we could we four of us could only do so much right so in order to expand we need to hire in order to hire we will need um more more cash flow 
So we actually got went overseas to apply for grants. And most of our grants are actually from overseas, from Europe, Dubai. Um, uh, unfortunately, I think uh, a lot of us can agree that the, the um, investment or the grant, the sin here in our region um, isn't, isn't that mature yet as of now to really invest so much in social enterprise. And I would say like countries in Europe are a bit more familiar with it. And I think a lot of companies in Europe has actually uh, started changing their way of doing CSR. Instead of giving donation, they now start uh, investing in social enterprises around the world so that the social enterprises go out there and make more impact. So that's a, a lot of them are doing, doing that now. Um, but other than that, I think um, to us, we, we have been approached by potential investors before and we have talked to potential investors as well. But I think as of now, um, for every businesses selecting, uh, not selecting, getting an investor is like getting married, right? A lot of people say you it, you are in a long-term yes. relationship in a way. Um, and I think that that rings even uh, louder for social enterprises where we are driven by a, a, an impact. So if we are not careful and we partner with an investor who might not share the same vision as us because we need that, that cash, we might end up putting ourselves in a place where we, we can't focus that much on impact and we have to focus on like the investment investor's milestone because because we have taken the investment yeah. so for uh, this we have we taken any investors no so no. we are no but we have uh worked with a lot of mentors uh potential investors probably but so far we haven't taken any invest investment yeah yeah Very because it is, it is it is true that uh we we know that uh it's it's going to kind of affect how things work in a way if we have investor yeah, yeah. So, so you rather put your business first and make sure that you are you are sticking to the mission. The, yes, definitely, definitely. We we have gone through programs where um, some of them ask us, okay, if you want to scale your business, um, can you uh, give up on this piece, like the community side? I'm like, no. Yeah. <laughs> so it was a very straight out answer. Like if you yes, so you they want you to turn into a regular uh, F and B yeah. business then. Yes, and <laughs> no, yeah, that's not how we see scaling. Uh, yes, we want to scale, but not at the cost of cutting off the original impact that we started for. Yeah. All right. And Emilia, for your hundred percent project, have you taken any investors? Yeah. So actually, we we were quite lucky because like during the magic demo day, that's where we met yeah. our angel investor. Nice. I consider her like a like probably our donor la, because really 100% 100% project if you look at the model and the way we structured it because in initially on the platform we only took an optional 15% fee. So meaning if donors want to give us that 15% they will take they can give if they don't want they don't have to give which means we get nothing. And when we started the 100% project it was really to solve a problem. I wasn't really thinking like oh I'm going to be a social enterprise, right? So the model actually looked, worked more like an NGO model because I came from an NGO background. But halfway through after that investment, that's when we realized like, oh no, you know, the platform itself is not gonna be able to sustain my team, which was getting bigger. And so then we decided, so that was when we actually pivoted, right? From an ad tech platform, we then decided to, okay, let's create programs, let's connect schools to corporates. So that's why we actually worked with a lot of corporate partners to come up with programs and connected them to schools. So. That's kind of how we made um, ourselves sustainable, you know, although it was quite hard, you know, to basically, you know, be a new company, go to like your big corporations and say like, hey, you know, we can do programs, right? So, but fortunately enough, because I think that the, the traction that we got in the beginning was quite good. I think also because of the goodwill, the stories from the teachers and everything. So we got a lot of corporate partners and that's basically how we sustained ourselves uh, over the years. Mm -hmm. All right, interesting. And we have another question. How does financial institutions, uh, for example, banks treat social enterprises? Are they supportive or do they consider social enterprises risky? Mm, I, I have never had much experience. <laughs> have you guys ever tried yeah. to take a loan from a bank? No, not yet. <laughs> no, no. But I guess, I guess that this, not this yet. doesn't make sense. Not yet, guys, not like, yet. Because, you know. Yeah. But for you to open a bank account, it's as usual, right? Like any regular business, right? Because mm -hmm. you're registered as a... Sorry? Uh, sorry, 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 sorry. No, not... Um, if no, I'm I mean, not... you're registered as a standard yeah. isn't it? It's a, it's a regular yes. business. If I'm not mistaken, there is one bank. I forgot which one. They are trying to come up with uh, special schemes for social enterprises. Oh, right. but it's not like launch yet but we've been seeing uh we've been seeing them uh a few times in like social enterprise events because they want to understand more 
So they're trying to see how, as a bank, they can help. Yeah. Hopefully. Okay, there's a very, there's a very yeah. long question. I don't know whether it's gonna. Okay, it appears on the screen. I'll read it out. I think that there's uh, still a need to clarify in a bigger space of what social enterprise is and essentially dispel the term charity. Perhaps even re-clarify what non-profit really is. For the past 10 years or so, this has not been addressed to the point that it has created a new problem as in getting talents into your social enterprise. And following the example above, how do you bring talents into your organization? How do you know an individual would fit uh, what the organization is doing? All right, <laughs> long question. <laughs> no, 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 no. Who want to take that? So I think it's more about yeah. talent, right? Uh, how do you get talents into a social enterprise? So I do think like, okay, so when we start a 100% project, like when I look back at the, the team that we've built, right, we were very fortunate to meet a lot of like people who are just very passionate about the mission. And I think like that's that's the draw of social enterprises, right? That, you know, I guess right now we've kind of re, we framed it, we called it impact driven businesses. So meaning is a business, but it's driven by impact, right? So it's basically something that's more business that are more ethical, more caring. You know, we don't take more profit than we need to make. You know, we try to be fair, right? So yeah, fair trade, that kind of stuff. So in terms of hiring, um, I've kind of been quite lucky uh, in terms of hiring talent. Uh, but then of course, uh, my team was also very young. So therefore, maybe young people are more drawn to this. You know, um, mm -hmm. they're more passionate as well. I, of course, in the, in the beginning, I didn't have enough um, money to hire someone who's a lot more experienced. So then I had to like train them a lot more. But I do feel like if the person has the right attitude, they have the right passion for it, they're mission aligned, uh, they're also impact driven. It's, I think it works a lot better. I would rather spend time training someone like this than someone who is looking at um, doing this just to like, you know, uh, earn a living, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I've been quite lucky. What about so you, the, the, the average uh, job seeker, right? When they come for an interview, for example, they just come looking for it as a job and then they find out what you guys are doing or they already know what you do and they, are, they want to be part of this mission. What kind of uh, job seekers do you usually get? I, well, the, I think the, the people who approach this uh, are people who, it's usually through word of mouth. Someone's heard about us or someone's donated on our platform. And then, you know, they had like a daughter or a sister was looking for a job and then they refer to us. So that's how we basically build our team. All right. Okay. All right. And uh, for you, Susan? Um, for me, I, I actually would like to address um, the, the front part where you talk about um, like what social enterprise really is. Um, unfortunately, around the world, there is no answer. Around the world, we can't define in a line what is a social enterprise because if you think about it, every single need requires a different model and a different business model. And it's almost impossible to just give a definition of what a social enterprise is. So for example, um, for example, if you want to say a social enterprise is if 51% of your profit goes to the goes to your beneficiary, then what about companies that work on environmental issues? So who are the beneficiary uh, beneficiaries? Are they not a social enterprise? And let's say if we work on a um uh, we work on a revenue sharing business model instead of profit sharing, so is that a social enterprise? So it's very very hard to give a clear line. And for um um for Amelia right, hundred percent project. What how do you find that? So. It's, it's hard for us to come up with one definition. And I would say, unfortunately, even among the social enterprises ourselves, there is also different views. Um, I remember I joined this program. Um, uh, I joined this program and, and it's a group of social entrepreneurs and we were debating about whether social entrepreneurs should get dividend. And there was like a cool side of it arguing. And in the end, there is no right or wrong. Because um, if, if you hear both sides, right, it's like, oh, the dividend should go to, to the community. Another side is, oh, but why is it okay for companies who are not for impact to take dividend but it's wrong when it's a social enterprise who tries to take dividend so there, there's a lot of things around because you you can't give an answer to like a human business so so it's just very hard lah. so i would say yeah. unfortunately it's really very difficult which is why currently we also try to we just 
we say impact driven business or we just say we are a food business that aims to rebuild lives and your meal rebuilds life end of story we we, we yes. don't want to label ourselves anymore that oh i'm a social enterprise because yes. it's yes. very confusing unfortunately so so yeah so now we introduce we are pizza is we serve you great food at the same time the chefs who are cooking your food their lives are rebuilt because of you end of story so yes. um uh, uh, yes. <laughs> So about hiring, um, about hiring, um, unfortunately, unlike Emilia, ours, ours was a mix of people who are looking for a job and people who wants to come in for a course. But for us, probably, honestly, our working environment is quite hardcore, like a lot of hustling. Uh, we start, mm -hmm. we start work at 7 a.m., like team meeting at 7 a.m., team learning at 7 a.m. Um, it's quite crazy. Some people actually say, why your work like that? But we, we focus a lot on like growth and we are all very early people. So, um, um, what we learned is that, um, yes, the core is very important to draw someone in, but the thing that keeps them is the culture and the team. So we learned that because two years ago, we tried to hire. We hired five or oh, five left. <laughs> and they left in a very, yeah, and they left in a not very nice, um, it wasn't a very nice um, parting. Um, it was quite sad for both sides because for us, um, we, we, we were kind of hurt. As well and for them they also feel like oh we, we are not very ready to lead which was true two years ago we weren't ready to lead we weren't ready to manage so they came in for the course but but they they didn't stay so it took us about one to two years to um like especially kim the current ceo she read so much she read so much so many books <laughs> on like netflix starbucks on how to manage people and things like that and we finally sort of have a clearer idea of what we want uh, for the team and from there we rehired again and right now we are um, we are a full-time team of 10 people including the three of us and i would say uh, most of them agree that they came in for the course but to keep them going in this hustling mode is really the team. So it's a team plus the cost together because I would say if you come in because you want to change the world or you want to give back, it will burn you out very fast. So mm. we always make it a point, okay, you want to come here to give to the community. What do you want to get in return? Then they will say, no, 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 I just want to give. Then we will say, no, what do you want to get? Do you want to grow? Do you want to be more effective? Do you want to be smarter and things like that? And we have to invest in that to train them yeah, so I think talent, it's a mix of like work culture. And I would say actually some people in our team came in not because they were drawn by the cause, they were drawn by the culture and then they developed the love for the community. So there is two ways of things. Yeah. Yeah. And, right. and Interesting. <laughs> and uh, another question, speaking about joint venture with investors, possible to work together with local universities to spread your business and do some CSR. Uh, are you guys doing any kind of collaboration with local universities? Mm. We have had local universities reach out, you know, when they want to do activities with students. So we're, we're always open to collaborations, uh, you know. Yeah. But you're more focused on school, right? Like high school and pr primary school, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, more, more focused on, on government schools. Uh, but now okay. we're kind of opened ourselves up to basically any education initiative. So even if you're in a refugee learning center or if you're okay. a student looking for a scholarship, We've opened up our platform to basically how, go wider. How, how, how is your relationship with the Ministry of Education? Are they very friendly with your initiatives? Are they supportive? Mm, it's been like, um, it's been a journey, definitely. I think when we first begun, I think a lot of teachers started using our platform. Then halfway through, then it garnered attention. And then, you know, the ministry, they knew, well, the thing is, they they basically needed to set certain policies. So we had to work with them on like, you know, how do teachers fundraise on our platform? You know, what kind of projects are allowed? So, but so far the response has been like positive. They want to work with us. So that's always a good thing. Right. And uh, Suzanne, how about you? Uh, um, I know you, you guys work with a lot of refugees. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of gray areas there. How supportive are our government agencies uh, with your initiatives? Um, we, we have spoken to uh, a few um, ministers, but in the previous government, um, actually everyone uh, personal, on the personal side, everyone is quite supportive actually. Um, but to change the policy is the tricky thing because you need to lobby, you need to change and it involves a lot of things beyond what we can comprehend like security issue. Um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's not as simple as um, just giving them the right to work and things like that, which we, we definitely would still want to push for it and we wish to push for it but it we know that it will take quite a long time 
but like right now what we are trying to do is uh, we are trying to go to the government in an angle where i mean currently we haven't because things has been yeah but um but last year we have been trying to go to the government and share with them what we do and to angle it in a way where if we allow refugees to work it can actually contribute positively to the economy so we don't go in in a human rights approach not like they deserve to work they deserve this right but more like hey you look at this if they work they are they can pay taxes we as a business who, who partner with them we, we can pay taxes so why not try so we are actually trying to um, show them that we have a business model that work and can they use us as a pilot so that was yeah. what we were going towards but it, it will definitely take time and right now we have to start all over again <laughs> yeah actually i've always wondered that right uh we take in refugees uh they get registered with unhcr and they're allowed mm -hmm. to be here temporarily until they get yeah. uh, moved somewhere permanent but yeah. they're not allowed to work so what is the idea actually how are they supposed to like support themselves pay rent buy food is there yeah. are they, is the government giving them any kind of allowance or is the un supporting them in any way what what is the idea actually all right. So basically, Malaysia, um, Malaysia is not a signatory of the UN Refugee Convention, which means that we do not have any legal framework set up to protect the refugees. So they are not allowed to work legally. Kids cannot go to public school, which is why a lot of refugee school has been set up by NGOs um, and yeah. so on. And healthcare is also an issue because Dala, you cannot work. You need to pay rental and then you need to get healthcare. So a lot of refugees in the community are actually uh, doing a lot of odd jobs. And some of them who are, a lot of them are actually very educated. So a lot of them who came from Syria, Palestine, extremely uh, educated. Uh, one of our chefs, the husband has a master's in uh, mech mechanical engineering from Canada or New Zealand. I forgot either one of the country, but because of the war, they didn't take him back. So they, they sort of blocked him out of the border. And in the end, he came to Malaysia because Gaza has like zero economic activity at that time. And the wife has a degree in accounting and finance, extremely smart, extremely extremely talented and smart and, and professional family, but right now they can't do anything related to their profession because they don't have work permit. So um, unfortunately, they, they can't work legally, but again, um, they they are very resilient. So they will find a way to make it no matter what. So they will sell shawarma, they will uh, work in Arabic shop, um, they, will, they will find always. So the reason why we started Picha was because our students, uh, we were volunteering in a refugee learning center. Our students at the age of 13, 14, they started working in KK Mart, Mamak stalls and Pasar Malam. And we are like, what the heck? So, so that was very heart, heartbreaking to see, which is why we started this business to work with the parents so that the kids don't have to go out and work. And, and unfortunately, um, that, that is the issue that we face, but we see a potential in uh, gig economy which is what we are doing. So they are they are cooking from home. What we do is exactly like Airbnb or Grab, where we are the platform that connects them to the clients, which means we are not employing them. So no work permit is needed. We are basically just taking the food, making sure it's clean, sent to the client, take money, split the money. So that is what we do. And eventually, uh, currently, we actually started one of our MCO baby is actually a content marketing, uh, content com company that <coughs> on like design, uh, social media content and so on. And our goal in terms of impact is that we can have like um, content writing and design academy where we train them and they can work from home just with the laptop. So that is that is a lot of things that can be done, especially now everyone works from home, right? Doesn't matter if you have work permit or not, it can be done. But can, do they have the access at the first place? One of our chef husband, he works with Amazon, like tech stuff from Malaysia, so he's fine. But a lot of them don't have the access to it. So so that's the situation. It's quite frustrating. Just now you asked me, they are here but they can't work, then how? I also don't know how. <laughs> which, is why, which is why um yeah, which is why a lot of people are trying to lobby and things like that. Yeah, yeah. because that never made sense to me, right? Because they're already here and uh, UNHCR mm. has already recognized them, given them yeah. a refugee status and all that. But they're not allowed to work or they don't get help. So it's it's yeah. a bit if you're already supporting them and recognizing their existence here, might as well, you know, let them work uh, mm. you know, legally, right? So that's, that's always been like an issue for me because I, I, of course, a lot of my friends, we have a lot of mutual friends who are all involved in this. Many people work with refugees in many ways. Uh, yes. Even my wife gets a lot of uh, refugees coming to her hospital where she works. So mm. it, 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 it's quite sad that now at this time, they're even more, you know, uh, life was already tough for them here. And now with the MCO, it's even, even tougher. And also with our grocery aid project, we've also been supporting a lot of the migrant workers and uh, yeah. refugees as well. Uh, yes. Because some of the Malaysian families, initially they needed help, but after the government 
uh, gave the you know BSH and all that, mm. they were a bit okay. They're like, oh, we got our you know government allowance, so we are fine. But the foreigners and all are, are still suffering. So we've sent out a lot of care packages for them. Uh, so hopefully it will make it a bit easier for them. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, another question I have uh, during this MCO, uh, have you had to make any hard decisions? I know you guys are like, you know, doing a lot of stuff and trying to still soldier on. But did you have to make any hard decisions in terms of your staff or your vendors or partners? Do you have to cut off anyone or, or maybe you know, hold on payment, things like that. Like, how are you struggling with that? Or is everything smooth? Thankfully, things are okay. Um, we, That's good. So, That's so good to hear. Uh, which is why we, we started, because as I mentioned, we expanded to a team of 10, right? So out of the 10, uh, four of us are on like marketing and creative, which is why we started our own company to sort of earn our own salary. <laughs> so, so yeah, so we started a new wing of business um, that um, generate content and like do storytelling for other brands so that it brings an additional revenue stream so that we don't have to lay off anybody. Yeah, but so far, so far it has been okay. I think the tough decision that needs to be made is just, okay, do we move on to the next business, which is completely different from what we do. Mm. Okay. Yeah. It's interesting. Well, On your side, Emily? Yeah. For, for, for me, I think with 100% Project, like I had to make the tough decision before the MCO. So we were going through financial struggles actually before MCO. So actually right now, we actually have more money in our bank account, we actually have a pretty sustainable runway after we've restructured the company. So yeah, we, we went through a difficult time, you know, last year, right? And so this year right now, uh, you know, thankfully, you know, um, the structure and everything is good. Lah. I mean, for the other enterprise I'm doing where we are developing hand sanitizers right now. So for the past one year, I was developing something else. So that was a hard decision looking at that and like, ah, you know, let's scrap that and start all over again. So, but it's the nature of things, right? Yeah. And and how's the scene in general? Like other startup, on, uh, sorry, social enterprises, your friends who are in the same industry, uh, are they all having the same situation or has anyone had to like shut down, for example? Um, I think we don't have any shutdowns. Yeah, I think... I think one amazing thing that we really see throughout this, not just in the SE scene, I think it's across all startups, uh, across everybody, everyone just come together. Yeah, uh, a, a lot, lot of cross collaborations, right? Yes, a lot of collaboration, a lot of partnership. You see the fashion industry coming together to sew, uh, to sew PPE. And then uh, we also come together with other social enterprises that does food, masala wheel. So we were sending food to hospitals. We were taking turns. Um, we um, Kim, um, Kim, one of my co-founders, she has been doing like a support group calls where she just put together a few social enterprises for us to like just talk about how difficult things is and we are here together. Okay, okay, let's move on. So I think we have seen a lot of of, um, collaboration and partnership and I think that's that's very nice to see and we just hope that even after this MCO we will continue this spirit where because it has always been somehow not sure why a challenge for a lot of people to work together like among NGOs among SE I don't know why um, which frustrates us sometimes is like oh, why cannot work together since we are all in the same same yeah. seat so yeah. now to see everyone coming together that's great la. like really sharing insights um yeah, that's that's been that has been the silver lining of this whole thing. Yeah, I think it's just the nature of business, right? You're designed to yeah. compete. Because that's what I, I've been trying to share with everyone as well. I and because outside good. yeah. Sorry, sorry. Because sorry. outside you see people like, you know, when you see somebody uh, going hungry, immediately yeah. people come together, pull up yeah. some, you know, money and then buy food for someone. Uh, we yeah. send groceries, we send food, all these things. But in yeah. the business scene, that's what I've been telling people, you know, businesses, entrepreneurs should come together as well and support mm -hmm. each other and try to write this out. We can always compete later, <laughs> you know, yeah. six months or one year after that and everything back to normal, then let's compete again. You know, for <laughs> now, it's all about trying to survive together, right? Write this out instead of, this is not yeah. the time for us to kill each other and compete yeah, and yeah. try to outdo each other, right? So yeah. I hope that that mentality, that mindset, yeah. uh, you know, kind of spreads among the entrepreneurship community as well. So, because end of the day, we, I mean, I don't want to see my friends have to uh, shut down their business or have to, you know, uh, mm. if die trying to survive. I'd yeah. rather support each other and, and do this. Yeah. So it's nice to see that the social enterprises are also coming together and, and getting, you know, their shit together. So that's good. It's always very nice to see. And I've been a community builder for a long time. So to me, when I see people coming together and doing stuff, it, it's always very nice to see that. Uh, yeah. Okay. And I also oh, think like ahead. within the social enterprise space, right? Like, um, you know, I think, especially during this time, there's going to be a lot of people that need need help. 
And so like not one organ no one organization can help everyone, right? So it is the time where everyone has to collaborate, you know, because there's just way too much, too, too many people that you need to that need help at this point in time. Mm. True. Okay, someone asked, uh, talking about government support, do you guys get any tax rebates <laughs> for being uh, a social enterprise? Do, do you? I mean, I <laughs> no, I don't. If you know, let me know, man. <laughs> I, I think uh, recently they started, like, if you get accredited, you get. I'm not very sure, but, yeah, I'm not sure. But for us right now, if the food is delivered to NGOs, like for now, because we are doing the Zaza movement, right, where food is delivered to NGOs or frontliners. So if the food is delivered to certain community, the the person who bought the food get a tax relief, not us. Oh. So the sort of the client uh, can get a tax relief. Yeah. Okay. And, so that, and that's that, done yeah. through your organization or directly from the government agency? Uh, if I'm not wrong, is is actually we are just a middle person, so we get yeah. we we help them to do the tax relief from the NGO who received the food that they gave. So again, we are ah, the okay. Leader. Yeah. Right. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Another question. A very long question. Let me read. Any plans to set up a centralized clearing house for information between NGO social enterprises to identify all parties in need, the kind of need, or match to specific compassionate supporters? and current status of any formal informal work to lobby Putrajaya or contribute financially directly to each case? <laughs> so I, well, this is not something 100% Project is working on, but if you go onto our platform, there is a coalition called Ruma Kita, and that's what they're currently doing, um, where they are trying basically try to centralize everything. So there's a hotline and then, you know, people call in the hotline and then they start distributing um okay. they have different partners you know so whoever that is able to fulfill that need fulfills that need so you can check that out um about lobbying putrajaya i'm not sure i don't know if that is currently no. ongoing and <laughs> but definitely i think people are thinking about like you know as we are looking at helping those in needs because there's so many parties that are looking at raising funds for ppe you know or buying food for the needy or migrant workers mm -hmm. and you have all these small pockets of uh grassroots movements that are do, uh, doing that so I think one of the things, um, I think people are still kind of figuring out how to bring everyone together and so that we don't overlap um, because this just happened, right? So um, if anyone's interested, uh, please go onto the platform. You can look out for Rumakita um, or you can reach out to me. I can connect you to the person who is running the whole thing right now. Yeah. So that's, uh, and that initiative is managed by? Uh Everyone, or is so it it's part a, it's, of an NGO? It's a big co coalition of like different NGOs, uh, social enterprises, or just grassroots individuals who just want to volunteer. This is uh, mm -hmm. basically a collaboration between Kita Jaga Tikita, uh, TEDx, BGBG. Basically, uh, it's basically a rope group la, that basically emerged out so of this. So this, this just happened during the MCO? Yeah, it? yeah, it just happened during the MCO. They, they even just created the logo like one month ago, right? But, <laughs> The right. idea is like, the, you know, the, the chat group is just getting filled with more and more people. So it's just becoming a bigger, bigger. So I guess that's the yeah. centralized system, you know, that, that chat group. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think the Facebook groups are getting too, you know, overwhelming <laughs> as well. You, know, mm. you start a Facebook group, then there's too many people who need help. There's too many people offering help and it just becomes a huge mess. So you need yeah, someone to yeah. actually organize everything. So it's good that, you know, the, the coalition has started to do that. Uh, yeah, it's, all right. coming together. it's coming together. <laughs> It's great, it's great. So this pandemic made a lot of organizations realize they are not prepared for external crisis. What have you guys done as a social enterprise to prepare for future crisis? Uh, this is a question from Safwan. Mm. Have you guys ever thought about preparing for a crisis before this? <laughs> like, have you ever thought that something might, like this might happen and you, you have to prepare for it or everything just started last month? <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> I think this is something that it's very hard to expect. Um, and yeah. even for now, when, you know, like for now, someone um, asks us, oh, so what, what's your plan for the future? Like, how, what do you expect things will be after COVID? We're like, we don't know. Same as you, our first time as well, okay? <laughs> so, so <laughs> you know, we, we don't know. We don't know how the world will be after this. So, I, but I think what we can do is definitely to be on our toes and to tell ourselves whatever it is, we just have to change and adapt and change and adapt. Um, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure how, but I think thankfully, uh, thankfully, one thing that we are thankful about is that we have always been um, a, a company that it can be good or not good. We don't, um, we don't spend too much. 
So we try to have as much like safe reserve as we can. So that gives us um, some, some level of security for now because we do have runway for like a year. So that, that gives us a security. Um, and that's because all these years we spend like, Sweden is our finance person. She, she will pin you down to every cent that you spend. And if you like buy certain things that the office already have, okay, like, die. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that whole culture and practice does help us where we don't, um, we don't spend on things that we shouldn't spend and i think one thing that we really learn now is of course again every business work differently so i can't say for all but we do see some businesses who like in one month they really like gonna close down which we as as entrepreneurs we also a bit worried like okay we need to be careful that um, we should always be ready for anything like this so i think generally just get ready for whatever that's gonna come and uh, to know that no matter what the world is sort of in this together no one knows what's gonna happen. So just just know that we are not alone. Now. It's not just our business being affected. Like everyone is affected. Yeah. And we still have a roof above our head. So that's that's like a that's something to be grateful for already. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Mm. Yeah. Like right. I think yeah. for me in terms of like crisis, right? Like it really depends. I think when you talk about external crisis, like basically the crisis affects your cash flow essentially your sustainability right yeah so i don't know like i think for coming from an ngo space i think like if you're in the ngo space you're always facing like a crisis you're always facing a sustainability issue this is like this is the normal right i mean uh, i got through this crisis last year you know and and it's like it's the same thing so i think it's like as you know, when you're in a social enterprise, you're NGO, you're always worried about sustainability. You're always trying to think about, okay, what can I do? What can I push out next? You know, how can I collab? Who can I collaborate with? So, in terms of prepping for future crisis, yeah, I think we're just kind of learning, You know, as things go, right? But I think we right. chose to be on this journal journey of entrepreneurship, even though social enterprise yeah. is entrepreneurship, right? Then it's gonna be like that. There's this one book that uh that Kim forced all of us to read. It's called The Hard Things About the Hard Things, and it's really mm -hmm. the hardest. Ever. and after we read this everything now it's like eh it's okay we can get through this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah okay next question let's look at this how can mm -hmm. we encourage one another uh, and promote more social enterprises among Malaysians um, uh, yes <laughs> okay so I think like I, I'm with I'm with Suzanne in the terms of labor the labels social enterprise right because I do feel like that does cause a lot of like confusion I like how Suzanne is basically so picture eats right you're a food business and at the end of the day the food business helps other people's lives easy <laughs> straightforward yeah. so I think like yeah. that's probably should be how businesses should be in evolving any business should be ethical sustainable right should be able to work with your community contribute to the community I think you will see businesses shifting in their, that direction going forward, even mm -hmm. when you're selling a product, right? Because consumers right now care uh, about brands that care, right? So if you don't sort of evolve yourself to being a brand or a company with a heart, uh, you will lose lose out in, eventually. So, so yeah, I think it's really more about getting people to think. I think this whole COVID MCO thing is great for everyone to start reflecting upon like your business are you essential or not? You know, mm -hmm. exactly. Are you offering value to your consumers, to your community, right? And if you're not, then how can you do that, right? To, to main, to remain relevant. Mm -hmm. So this time is a time for us to think, like, you know, is what we're doing is it relevant in the grand scheme of things? So yeah, yeah I guess like in terms of encouragement, is really like getting us to really think about this fact. Mm. Yeah. Um. Um. For me, um, I think the. About the time me and Emilia started um, on this uh, SE journey, that was when Magic was spearheading it a lot. Like there was a lot of conferences, Sahati. And I think they really did a great job in bringing out the awareness for social entrepreneurship because at that time, you go to university, that's like SE talks all over the place, conferences and things like that. And But unfortunately, after that, it sort of like uh, slowed down. And right now, we do see a gap in the... Um, the younger generation that they haven't heard about this before. So which is why we also started doing um, a lot more sharing. So we do IG Live, um, we go into school and tell them, or oh, if you want us to come in to give a talk, we can come in and give a workshop and a talk. Um, we do workshops for people who are interested to learn more about social entrepreneurship. So they just join in and learn about the basics. So we try to do what we can because 
because four years ago someone taught us that and the reason why we got this idea to start Picha was because we heard from um elena from arus academy we heard from uh we heard from nasi lemak project so uh, we heard from bgbg rashmin um and epic homes johnson because of all of them we look up to them and we got this idea and now we also want to do the same and give back so that more people get to learn about this but ultimately um i agree with emilia where where social enterprise isn't just social enterprise but it is something that all businesses should actually look into and what we always say is um we always ask people when we talk to them um the question is how can you be you and, and make a change so as a business how can your business make a change which in whichever way you can as a student how can you make a change and ultimately if the solution isn't social entrepreneurship which means you don't need a social enterprise maybe you need an ngo like what emira said not all solutions can be solved by an se ultimately if you need an ngo or you need a for profit business or whatever it is lah, um if the intent is correct and your thought is to make a change and to make things better for people then it doesn't have to just be social entrepreneurship that is not the ultimate solution um it's one of the way yeah <laughs> very good answer <laughs> yeah. but because for me right the whole idea of social enterprise is you know it came out of the need to be sustainable because I, yeah. i actually come from an ngo background as well you guys mm. may not know but that was like 20 years ago <laughs> i'm wow. quite old Yeah so at that time that was the buzz right uh, NGOs yeah. non-profits were all trying to figure out how do we become sustainable mm. and that was what everybody was trying to crack and then after a few years the whole idea of uh, social enterprises came out and to me that was like perfect right yeah. so that's the only way you can make uh, people who want to do good for the world but make mm. them sustainable uh, which yeah. is why for me every time somebody says social enterprise I'm like yeah great I'll be supportive right I'm like all for you I mean different people have different business models Uh, different ways of making money but as long as it creates that impact uh, it helps uh, the the society i think uh, it it's a great thing to encourage so my my next question is how do we try to get regular startups to have that kind of impact i mean they might not start out as a social enterprise but mm. is there a way uh, just a regular startup who are maybe well funded or have a good business model who are sustainable financially uh, how can you guys encourage them to now have a a social impact uh, element to their business is there a way or any ideas you guys can share mm. well I, i think like for in when we started 100% project in the beginning we did work with uh, food panda we worked with um I think groupon at the time you know because the when we crowd fund uh, our donors get rewards right And so mm. we did collaborate with like Food Panda and like th- these other startups to provide like little vouchers, you know, and coupons, like a promo code. So there are ways like that, right? Um and of course like there's the the CSR route where you channel your funds to people who are doing the work, right? If you yourself are not. I don't think there is like a strict rule on how to do this, right? I mean, it could be also like, you know, open up, opening up your employment um to communities that actually need it, right? Um because there's so many modules in terms of uh, how a social enterprise can work. So there's no hard fast rule. Um I think it's really just about, you know, looking at your business, looking at what you have, you know, who can you work with or what can you do. But I would always suggest that you know if you're a startup, there are a lot of social enterprises and NGOs out there who are already doing a lot of great work on the ground, right? So I would say like work with these people. you know uh see what they need sometimes what they need may not necessarily just be funding it could be just like marketing expertise because a lot of NGOs actually struggle with marketing quite a bit so yeah. if that is something that you can offer i think most people would definitely pick it up yeah and yeah, so then you have <laughs> Um, I think uh, we do have a few example. Like for example, we know uh, Starbucks took in cookies made by Silent Teddies, who are all uh, deaf. Mm-hmm. Um, so they take in cookies from them, and and that is one way they make impact. Um, we know Alliance who make it a point where all are, all their catering must come from social enterprises. So that's us, that's Masala Wheels, that's Delisha. So in every company. Yeah, that is what they do. And um, in M Bank, they take uh, they take Raya dog gifts. Um, Raya gifts, sorry, not dog gifts. Raya gifts from us and Silent Teddies as well, so that the Raya gifts is actually giving back to the community. So again, like what Emilia said, is seeing where you can make a conscious purchase, and that conscious purchase actually impacts someone or a conscious hiring. Like in the McDonald's near my house, they hire um, uh, youth with with um disabilities. So um, I think one one boy there, he actually has autism, but he has. Been working there for about a year already. I keep seeing him, and 
and most of the of the clients are actually very nice to him like when he when he does something um that that probably other other uh, waiting staff won't do they they are okay with him and sometimes he come to our table he chat with us um then we chat with him um and i think that is a way of making an impact as well so so it's really like what Amiya said it's just all the little things that you can do lah. Right, very interesting. So you got a very interesting question here. How yeah. do you benchmark your impact? Uh-huh. When do you say you have reached your target? This is from, uh, <laughs> the name is not uh, appearing. Oh, this is from Heyman. Suzanne, we always get asked this question, right? <laughs> How yeah, do so uh, okay. you guys have like a standard or you have your own different ways of benchmarking okay. your impact? So for impact measurement, it really depends on, uh, again, different community, different need, different uh, social enterprises. Um, for us, I won't say we, we, I don't think we will ever say one day, okay, we've reached our target, we can stop now. Um, it's, it's not possible because we live in this world where problems doesn't end. If one day problems end, then wow, that's great. But realistically, mm. we know it won't happen. Um, so people do ask us, where is the end goal? Um, there is no end goal. You just... You just keep moving. Um, and how do we benchmark our impact? I think it is true that there will never be an ending, but at least we will have milestones. Like, for example, we started this year with 11 family and we want to reach um, 21 family by the end of this year. So there are little milestones that we reach. Um, but ultimately, um, it's not just about hitting numbers. So this is one thing that we always discuss as well. Do you skill in quantity or quality? Do you go wide or do you go deep? It's a endless battle. But for us, we want to go deep. So we don't want everyone to just earn like 200, 200, 200 each. We want to make sure everyone have enough to sustain uh, every single month, which is why our numbers won't grow so fast as of now. Because um, even though our numbers for the past four years, now we are at uh, 12 active, active kitchen and three more on boarding. 15 doesn't look a lot. But if you look at it, it has been four years of monthly income for these families. And that is... Um, that is sometimes people don't see that. Lah. They will ask us, oh, four years ready, why still 15 families? Um, and that is what we have to explain because it is a quality impact. It's not just about quantity. Of course, our challenge right now is to think how to scale this. How do we maximize this to more people? And that's something for us to solve. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. In terms of 100% project, it's a lot more straightforward because for us, like, our impact is measured per project raise, right? So basically, ours is like, how much funds have we raised for teachers? So in, I think for the past four years, we probably raised about 1.5 million for, for wow. teachers around Malaysia. Yeah. Too bad that's not my revenue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, I'd be very sustainable. <laughs> Won't go through crisis. But yes. So, um, but that's the nature of the platform, right? Um, in terms of, for I think the nature of our work is very straightforward because um, the impact is in us supporting teachers. Uh, th- we believe that teachers uh, know best um, in what to do in their classrooms and a lot of them need to be empowered and be given the right resources and tools. So our platform um, basically is created to serve that need. So it's easier for us to basically um, calculate, you know, what's our impact and everything because it's really a numbers thing. All right. Okay, so that's all very interesting. And uh, actually, I'm very happy that you guys are all very busy soldiering on and uh, you are creating, still creating impact. I mean, you are already creating impact. That's what your business was all about. And then now we're in this COVID situation and everyone is like, all you know, some people are just clueless, right? Don't know what to do. But you guys are still on with the mission and you're still helping so many people. I, I'm very, I'm, I'm so happy personally to see. I mean, I, I met both of you guys, I think, at the very early stage when you first started, right? I think I met Amelia just after she came out of the, the magic. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, early after days. Your de- I think I met you like one or two weeks after your demo day. Uh, <laughs> even Suzanne, I think we I had a s- session with you. Two uh, years back, probably, in CyberJack. Yeah, we, we discussed about some social uh, social yeah. media marketing and all that. So, yeah. and to see you guys have you've come uh, such a long way in such a short period of time. <laughs> So, so that's really interesting to see, and and, and I, I hope you guys continue doing this right for a long, long time. But uh, personally, uh, how how do you see the the future of the social enterprise scene in Malaysia? Do you feel like we need more social enterprises, uh, or do you feel like we need more investors to look into this space? Like, what do you see for the future of the social enterprise scene in Malaysia? 
Hmm. Well, I, I do think that people are going to, especially right now, when you see a lot more collaborations, um, not just social enterprises, but also NGOs. You know, I think this is where people really see um, the value of a lot of these NGOs. For the longest time, you know, when you work in an NGO, it'd be like, you know, usually people don't really regard you as much, you know, and people always think that you're not supposed to be paid that much, you know, and all that stuff, right? But I think during this time, I think people are going to finally value people who work in this space and, you know, start also appreciating the fact that, yeah, you know, we, we have to, um, these, this is an, an actual profession. And when it comes down to it, you know, th these are the organizations that will step up and actually help the ones who actually really need it. And I think like by seeing this and seeing how social enterprises are right now, like uh, ensuring employment for the most vulnerable communities to like what uh, Suzanne is doing, right? Uh, to ensure that food still goes out to people who need it, right? People will, I think seeing these examples will inspire people that, yeah, you know, this is what businesses should be, right? You can be sustainable, but at the same time also um, be impactful or contribute doesn't matter whether the impact is large or small, right? But you can also create impact within your own communities. So I do see an emergence of um, more, I, I don't like to use the word social uh, enterprise, but like, you know, more businesses that are more impact driven, who are more socially conscious. Yeah, yeah, I think definitely, right. yeah, same. We would love to see more people um, to, to keep impact in mind. Um, I think just generally, generally, um, how how all of us everyone are uh, not just entrepreneurs or whoever like in life we always strive to progress and move forward we have all these fancy tech coming up and things like that but as we progress um do we forget the people who don't have the chance to progress and as we progress are we bringing um the community together with us so that we walk together or are we just progressing on our own forgetting about the others so i think that applies to um, the government, the policies, the companies, the people, students, education, it just goes across to remember that there are people who who will very likely get left behind if you don't remember them just because of circumstances. So I think that realization, yeah, that realization just we just wish more people are aware of that. Yeah. yeah because and also I think like with, oh sorry, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, yeah, no, go. I, I was I was thinking like also like during this whole MCO period, right? And this is my personal realization. I realized mm. I actually don't really need that much money to <laughs> live, especially like, you know, when you're kind of at home. Because at the end of the day, like, you know, as long as you have stuff to put food on the table, you're comfortable, you really don't need that much, right? Mm. So I think like when you're looking at, you know, before this, I think in the past, when people think about making, uh, building businesses, it's all about money, 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 you know? Like I want to be, uh, scale and be be as rich as possible, right? And I think a pandemic like this really hits you really hard. What are you gonna do with all that money? You know, when you can't go out, when you can't buy things, right? So I think like this is where you realize that you know what, um, businesses can actually you can build a business where it's actually um, spread out where you you take your share, right? Whatever that's comfortable for you. But then you know for others to also be able to live the same life because at the end of the day. You know, whatever we're seeing right now in Singapore, for example, with the migrant workers, yeah. when in a society, there's there is a portion of, of society where they do not have enough. Like maybe day to day when things like that don't, uh, when a pandemic is not happening, you may not see the impact. But when something like that happens, you realize that we are all interconnected. And if yeah. one part of the community is not taken care of, it affects us too. Yeah. Right. So we have a very interesting question, another interesting question from Jung. If you had to get parliament to pass one new law or spending bill, what would it be? Oh, wow. This I is very interesting. One um, one that I think will speak for Emilia too, education for all, because that will change almost everything. Um, yeah. Education for all and then probably working rights for all. <laughs> But but of course with proper regulations lah, like not like okay everyone can work now, um. Yeah. But yeah, uh, just the basic rights, healthcare, education. I think ultimately it comes down to these three: education, healthcare, and um working working rights. Because once you get education, you get better work, and once you work, you can take care of yourself. You don't need to you don't need mm -hmm. to rely on 
CEO, you don't need social enterprises and things like that. So, and then healthcare to just give them the access and they have work already so they can afford healthcare. So in the end, it to, to us, it sort of comes down to this tree, but of course there's a lot more um, other issues, but if I want to clump everything together, it's sort of like this tree. Yeah. And done line line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For me, I would, you, love Amelia, say, yeah. I, I would love to see universal basic income but I don't know how we're going to fund it. Because <laughs> <laughs> you think like oil, right? But then oil now like this. So I don't know how we're going to fund it, you know? Um, but yeah, you know, it would be nice for, for people to have safety nets. The ones who don't, you know, who don't have safety nets to have safety nets, right? Because once you actually have that universal basic income, then, you know, everything becomes easier. Education, you know, it's not, it's not a means to the end, right? But it's a way for people to, to it's like, you know, lessen people's burdens i think i think it, it elevates society to another level yeah yeah so yeah. if you ever start any initiative to lobby the government on you know universal basic income count me in <laughs> i definitely would like to i will definitely join because that's that's something that i've thought about a lot right i'm very yeah. passionate about that. maybe malaysia is very far away still i mean even yeah. around the how world, are we gonna fund it? i don't know just... how we're gonna fund it <laughs> yeah well, we don't have we I mean, that's the whole idea, right? I mean, as entrepre yeah. entrepreneurs, we always face challenges and then we, we figure out solutions. Uh -huh. So, you know, I'm sure we can so figure we can out start a coalition. We can start a coalition. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see whether we have any new questions. Uh, it's, a, it's a good idea on increasing formal processes for undocumented people. It would help my entire staff. <laughs> So yeah, I guess the government definitely can do more. I think in this in this scene, uh, we we do have a lot of uh, illegal workers. We have I mean, migrant workers who are undocumented, and then we have refugees, and they're part of our society. I mean, as much as personally, I will feel like we can't just simply open our doors, you know, to everyone. But if they're already here, they're part of society. Then definitely they should be taken care of, right? We can't just abandon them. But of course, it has to be done properly. I mean, I I would want. Uh, refugees who come here to get properly vaccinated, to make sure their healthcare is taken care, they, you know, their families are taken care, their kids can go to school. If mm. not, then they become, you know, a problem to the society. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm sure the government can do more, and I, I hope they do. And maybe we need more social enterprises to work in this scene, so that in a way you guys can influence the government. Uh, mm. I think, yeah, maybe we we should also encourage you know more people to think about these kind of problems, right? And try to come up with a a business model that in a way supports that 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 society so hopefully that's interesting uh, any other questions we have a lot of questions coming up mm. oh <laughs> ubi is just printing money the offset is just to tax elsewhere then you alter the distribution of income <laughs> so yeah I, i'm sure we can figure out a way so generally a lot of questions just say how awesome you guys are so <laughs> the comments oh, are all you know about how both of you are so awesome so uh but the names are not appearing so i don't want to publish all but later you can check the thread you know when you go to the stream right all the mm -hmm. comments below so make sure you guys check all the compliments you're getting <laughs> so, <laughs> it's always a good I, I love compliments it's always a good, a good <laughs> you know it keeps you going right sometimes you're feeling down and you see a nice comment on facebook uh, which is why Facebook can also be damaging, right? You see the bad comments. <laughs> so, anyway, guys, we've been at this for about uh, one hour, 20 minutes now. I said one wow. hour, but we've gone past wow, the one hour. Yeah. Nice. So that it's, it's been a really interesting discussion. So I hope I didn't take too much of your time. No worries. Uh, no, no, no worries. Thanks for the, 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 the chat, you know. Yeah, uh, this has been great. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much for sharing. No uh, I think we can wrap up our session today here. Uh, okay. and a lot of interesting stuff uh, and i hope everyone who's watching this uh, now or later the recorded view uh, i'm sure they they learn a lot about the social enterprise scene and what you guys have been doing and i'll be sharing all the links on the description on the comments later uh, sure. link it to your your websites and your page and all this so people can check out what you guys are doing and hopefully they can support you in in some way or other right uh, so thank you so much thank you for the sharing oh, thanks uh, for having uh, thank i you wish so you guys much. good luck hope uh, everything good and We'll all bounce back from this this COVID yes. situation, yeah. right? So yes. next time we do a live stream, and hopefully you all have a, a more positive news to share with us. Sure, we will hopefully. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we will be able to write this out. Thank you so right, much. Yes. Thanks okay, to everyone okay. who's watching. Bye bye. Good night.
All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. I think that was a very interesting chat uh, with these uh, two amazing entrepreneurs. Uh, I've been seeing them since uh, the first day they started, not, only not the first day, <laughs> I know, very early stage of their startups. And I've been very supportive of what they do. And, uh, and I've tried to help uh, in whatever way possible. And they've grown so much. Uh, their social enterprises have grown so much. And now they are both uh, icons in the scene. And uh, the sharing was so amazing. And I, I hope you guys are really inspired after watching this. And hopefully, uh, for some of you who are not familiar with social enterprises, now you know what social enterprises are all about. And I'll also share all the links later so you guys can check out uh, what they do at the 100% project and what they do at the Picture Eats. Uh, and you know, you guys can support them in any way possible. And uh, if you are inspired by this and you want to launch your own social enterprise or a startup with a, a social cause or some kind of impact to society, I'm sure you can always uh, reach out to Amelia or Suzanne and get their you know, some, uh, some advice from them or some guidance on how you too can also start something like this. Uh, so thank you so much for joining this chat. Uh, it's been a, a great session and I hope I can come back to you guys with another topic uh, with more interesting uh, friends uh, who are doing amazing things and they get to share uh, their experience as well, right? So till then, uh, take care guys, stay safe, stay at home. Uh, don't go out anywhere except for grocery shopping uh, and food, but even that, try to get it delivered so that you don't have to go out if you don't have to. Stay safe and I'll see you guys again in another live chat. Bye-bye.